orthopedics, um, MSK and endo. Um, it's pretty long, so I might be talking quite fast and I also won't be reading the questions in the chat just because I won't have time to answer them, but um, the other Muppets girls will answer them. And then if there's any ones that they can't answer, we'll collate them on our docs. Excellent. So um, starting off with ortho and MSK, these are the conditions I'm going to go through. I'm not gonna go through this list right now, um, but that's um, the way I'll be ordering them. So first of all, MSK abnormalities. So this flows on nicely from Nick's presentation. Um, I'm just going over the baby's head shape. Um, so when a baby is born, often their head shape is irregular at birth, and this is just because they've been squished through the birthing canal. Um, often the head shape will become uh, a normal, more round shape by six weeks. However, some babies can have plagiocephaly, which is when their head shape becomes abnormally shaped or flattened or uneven. Um, so there are a number of ways we avoid plagiocephaly and this is by rotating the sleep position of the baby. So whether that's um, putting them up one end of the cot and rotating the end of the cot, or if they're particularly, particularly fond of something in the room, making sure to move the cot around. So if they always want to look at that object, um, they're not always in the same position. Other things include laying the baby on their tummy as this gets their head off the ground um, and, and off the back of their head. Um, and then other things to think about is just holding the baby and carrying the baby around, putting them in different slings or um, kind of adjusting your arms when you are holding them. If positional therapy doesn't work, that is when we move on to helmet therapy. So these are the cute little helmets that you see babies in. Um, so these helmets are actually helping to reshape the baby's head. Um, so we have uh, on one side, it's quite tight. Um, and that's the side that's trying to reshape the head. And the other side, it's quite loose. Um, so the skin integrity should also be checked regularly as well. This baby's wearing the helmet, but they um, where there's no set time that they wear it for, it's just dependent on the um, orthopedics or their pediatrician. Um, and then there's cr craniosynthosis, which can also lead to um, abnormal shape of the baby's head. So this is premature fusion of the sutures. Um, so as we know in the skull, the, the, when the baby's born, their, their head is quite friable and the skull can, bits can kind of move around um, and eventually the sutures fuse but if it occurs too early um, the head shape can become abnormal just because the brain and everything is still growing. So the sagittal suture is the most common that fuses early and then there's the um, metopic and coronal sutures as well. Um, so this is kind of how the head will be deformed. So if the sagittal suture fuses early, often the baby gets like frontal bossing um, and they get quite a large forehead. Um, sometimes you don't actually need to do anything for these babies um, and the hair will just kind of cover it up. But for all of these, you can also have um, surgical correction as well. Metopic sutures, um, if that fuses early, you get like a swept back appearance. So the eyes and the brow kind of look like they're on the side of the head um, and the they'll look like they've been swept back. Um, unicoronal, so this is where one of these sutures fuse um, and you'll get an asymmetrical forehead. And then there's lamboid. Um, and just because of the position of the lamboid suture, this one requires surgical intervention because it can affect um, growth and development of the baby and it may lead to intellectual disabilities as well. So this one we don't leave, we actually operate and um, unfuse the suture essentially. Um, but the other ones you can leave. Um, okay, I thought I had a question there, but I obviously don't. Um, so moving on to club foot. So this is um, congenital talipes equinovirus. Um, and it's when, so when the baby is born, you'll notice that the feet, um, often both of the feet, are kind of turned in and down and off to the side. Um, so you can also have babies who it's where it's not congenital and it's more just positional or they're kind of squashed in the uterus. Um, and this one, so the way you tell the difference is because in congenital um, talipes, you'll be able to, um, it's quite, the foot is quite 
stiff and you can't really move it back to its normal position. Whereas in positional therapies, it's quite flexible and you can easily move it back. So that's really how you, how you tell the difference between the two. Um, and the positional one will just resolve spontaneously, whereas the congenital one needs quite extensive management. Um, it's actually quite common with a large number of babies being born with clubfoot. Um, but it's, we manage it very well um, and it's very, very treatable. So often it's detected antenatally and it can be associated with oligohydramnia um, and also smoking in preg pregnancy. So the first thing that we will do is we reassure um, the parents and just let them know that it's common and it does, it's very treatable and um, we can easily fix it. Um, but there is quite a few years of management. So, um, so the first is the Ponsetti technique and this is casting. Um, so what we do is when we, um, when we adjust the, like each week the baby's feet will be slowly adjusted um, and every time we adjust it, you, we re the, the cast is replaced um, until the baby's feet are back into a normal position. And once they're back into this position, what they often do is do an Achilles tenotomy. Um, so they inject local anesthetic and just kind of nick the Achilles tendon. Um, and that's because if you don't do that, the tendon is really tight. So the feet most likely won't stay in that position. Um, unlike with positional where it's quite flexible and you can move the feet however you want. Then once you've done that, they stay in the cast for another couple of weeks. I think it's around three weeks they stay in the cast for. And then um, they're put into this little adduction brace. Um, looks like a little baby snowboard. So the babies wear this for 23 hours a day for three months. And then after that, they just wear it overnight. So for 16 hours a day until they're four years old. Um, so it's quite a long process, um, but the children develop normally. They're able to walk as every other child does. Um, they just have to wear this little adduction brace. And this is just a little cartoon that I found. Um, well, it's a little book about this child with the introduction. But, um, yeah, so just, um, um, Ash, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Yeah, it's sort of crackling. I think cutting in and out, Ash. Same for me. I'll take out my earphones. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to turn off my Bluetooth so they don't reconnect. Sounds much better, Ash. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. So, hang on. Where's the chat? Yeah, good. Um, so, congenital um, dysplasia of the hip. So with this question, um, I'll go through it all, but what you're looking at is particularly pointing out the asymmetrical skin fault um, and the shortening of the right leg. And that leads you, that should lead you to um, DDH. So DDH describes a, a large number of conditions which affects the relationship of the femoral head in the acetabulum. Um, and it often leads to hip instability. So we need to manage, manage it um, quite early and most babies, uh, well, all babies are screened for it, so that way we can get on to managing it quickly. So the way we screen for it is through both the um, Ortolani and Barlow manoeuvres, and this is done before a baby is discharged home from hospital, and then it's done after birth, um, after at the, and then it's done at every maternal child health nurse visit until the child is walking independently. We also assess how they're walking as well, um, because um, they they will have an abnormal um, gait when they're walking. Other things we can look for is um, the asymmetry of the skin folds, which was in that question. Um, also the femur length and, the, and as I mentioned, the gait. So there are a number of risk factors for this condition. Um, the main ones are breech babies and things that reduce intrauterine compression. Um, and this is just because it's essentially squishing the baby and the femurs don't develop in the acetabulum um, as they should. So things that we're particularly concerned about include macrosomic babies, um, oligohydramnios, um, any multiple births, and if it's a firstborn as well, as often the uterine space is smaller. Um, females are also at an increased risk. Um, 
which is on my list, I think. So this is the Barlow and the Ortolone um, tests. Um, so you always do Barlow first, and that's because you want to try and dislocate the, um, the femur, whereas Ortolone is replacing the femur into the acetabulum. Um, so you always put your finger on the femoral head, uh, or your middle finger on the femoral head, and then you're pushing down and abducting for the um, um, Bartoloni, and then Arlo, you're going the other way and pushing up and replacing the femoral head. So we do that for every baby before they're discharged home. And you'll feel like a conk when it's dislocated. So how we investigate this, now this is taken directly from Monash Prompt. Um, so all newborns with risk factors or an abnormal assessment, they have an ultrasound at six weeks post their due date. So if they're a um, preemie, then they'll have an ultrasound um, six weeks, like when they were meant, after six weeks when they were meant to be born. Um, if they have a mild um, DDH, then, and they're young, then you just repeat the ultrasound in six weeks and see how they go. Um, and if it's still present at the six week mark, that's when you refer to pediatric orth orthopedics. If it's mild and they're over three months, if it's moderate or severe, you just refer to pediatric, uh, you refer to ortho straight away and you also repeat the ultrasound in six months. Um, so I have a picture here. This is um, kind of just the severity of DDH. So essentially mild is stable and you can just kind of feel slight movement. Um, so these ones may not necessarily need um, treatment and that's why you repeat it in six months as their body grows and the muscles become stronger around the area. Um, but obviously as these kind of grow up, you can see that this one is obviously going to need quite um, extensive management um, and these ones, as well, same thing. So with the management, the first thing you do for kind of moderate or mild is the pavlic harness. So this is where you have the hips in both flexion and abduction, and the baby stays in that harness for quite a while, for 24 hours a day, um, and it's just replaced. They have a weekly assessment with a physio. The physio will assess um, the harness and how they're going in it, and also check skin integrity at where the harness is kind of touching. And then that they yeah put a clean one on there. Um, you can also do closed reduction under anaesthetic. So this is if the hip is not. Um, so if we go back to this picture, if it's not going back into or this one here, so irreducible. If it's just not going back in place, then you'll do a closed reduction. Um, but if you still can't get it back in place after that, that's when they do the open reduction. So they cut open the hip or the the skin and push it back. Um, and with an open reduction, they also put them into a hip spicker, which is a, a cast, essentially a pavlicanus made out of plaster. Um, so they're still, the hips are flexed and in abduction, but they wear this, um, uh, well, the time is decided by the orthopedics as like a lot of this management. Um, and then there's an osteotomy as well. So if open reduction or anything doesn't work, that's the last line management. And this is just what the, the harness looks like. Um, so the baby just stays in it like this. Um, and the parents kind of change their clothes and nappy around it. Okay, so moving on to mechanical arthralgias. Um, so this includes a limping child. So I'm not going to go through this entire flow chart, but a good way to divide up a limping child is by looking at these four things. And that can also help you determine the severity of the limp. Um, so asking about duration, did it come on straight away or or acutely, or has it been there for a long time? Any trauma, um, if they've fallen, or if you're concerned about non-accidental injury. Uh, fever, so that's when you're going to be concerned about infective causes, and then pain as well. So pain is a good way to differentiate between your differentials. Um, so if it's constant, it's going to be something more like a fracture or arthritis, um, or intermittent, also arthritis, um, but things that come and go as well, like Auschwitz schlatter which we'll go through. Um, so you're just similarly with that flow chart, this is just how you're going to take your history. So you're going to be asking about the duration of symptoms and things that have been there for longer than, or a limp that has been there for longer than seven days is kind of more of a red flag than things that have been there for less than seven days, often because um, the things that are going to self-resolve should have self-resolved by seven days. 
Um, history of trauma or fall, pattern and severity of pain. If it's severe and localized, you're more concerned about things like septic arthritis. So that's your red flag. Changes to urinary or bowel habits. That's, um, you're concerned about that because it could be neurological damage. Same with functional limitations. Nocturnal pain. Now this is um, kind of pathognomonic for um, bone cancers in children. Often they'll wake with this nagging bone pain. Um, so if you have a child that ha is having nocturnal pain, you need to be concerned. Same with systemic and constitutional symptoms. And then you ask about a recent viral infection as well. And then examination. Um, so see how the child is, see how they're interacting with their carer. Um, if they have a fever, um, so uh, yeah, again, I've just highlighted the red flags. Assess their gait, um, because that'll kind of give a lot away, particularly if they don't want to walk at all. Um, examine the joint, so look how it's resting, um, if they're holding it in a certain position, if it's swollen, if there's any skin changes, um, if there's any kind of um, uh, injuries over the, over the joint that's sore as well. Um, like scratches or anything, feel the joint, move the joint and always get them to move the joint first, just so you know what they're capable of. If they're just sitting there and don't want to move the joint at all, you're not going to move it for them. Um, do a neurovascular assessment as well. Um, always look above and below the joint. In children, sometimes with appendicitis or testicular torsion, they will present with hip pain. So you need to always be assessing the scrotum in a young boy who's presented with hip pain um, and also always do an abdominal assessment as well. Again, you're going to look at the back or spine in case you're concerned about um, any, any neuro um, symptoms or anything. And then petechiae purpura and ecchymosis. Um, again, this is just, they're just more worrying signs um, that you need to be aware of. And it's not just going to be kind of like a mild injury. Okay, so um, another question. Good, so I've got a few answers coming through. Um, so this is Sufi. So the slipped upper femoral epiphysis um, and the things that you kind of make, should make note of in this um, EMQ is that this is a well child with a mild pain. He's also kind of nearing adolescent age um, and he's overweight. So they're kind of your buzzwords. Um, the other thing is externally rotate, rotate, rotation of the um, leg as well. So Sufi is when the femoral head displaces um, off the um, femur um, and it's via the growth plate. So it's kind of like the, the head just slips from the, um, at the point of the growth plate as this picture demonstrates. And it's more common in overweight children and that's just because of the weight um, that's being put on the joint. Um, so it can, it, it's classified into either stable or unstable. With stable, these kids are able to walk and they walk in saying they've got hip pain. Unstable, they're not able to wait there at all. Um, and often this is more of an acute presentation as well. Um, so you're really concerned about these kids if they come in not able to walk and they, they describe the sensation that they feel like their hip is kind of dislocating. Um, so most of the time if they present with a vague pain in the groin um, and it kind of goes down into the thigh or the knee as well um, and often it's chronic so they complain that it's been happening for a few weeks um, and then eventually they've had enough of it so they either present to ED or their GP. Um, so they'll present with kind of a, an odd gait um, and that's just because of the instability of the joint. They're unable to walk as they normally would um, and there's often shortening of that limb and that's because the femur is being pushed up and as the femoral head is pushed down. Um, and they often get external rotation of the leg during hip flexion and that's just because of the way the femur is moving um, because the femoral head is still sitting in that, in that joint space. So how you investigate this is, is you do an anteroposterior and frog lateral x-ray of the pelvis. So this will give you a good view of both of the hip joints. Um, and as you can see here, this femoral head sits very nicely in the acetabulum and it's quite smooth. Whereas this one here, as you go up, it kind of drops off. And you can see that the line is not, it's not joint onto here. Um, and that's how you're going to tell that it's Sufi. So as soon as you see this, or if you suspect it, you're going to keep this child 
um, off their feet and urgently refer them to orthopedics as it requires surgical intervention um, and the, the femoral head needs to be put back onto the femur. Um, so in terms of complications, one you're, you're most concerned about is osteonecrosis because the um, blood, there's, um, the vessels are quite essentially fragile um, in that joint and the slipping off of the femoral head can tear a lot of the blood vessels to the, um, to the um, head. So that's, you're concerned about osteonecrosis and that's why you refer so urgently to orthopaedics. Most of these kids, if they've had it for a while, if it's been quite chronic or if it's unstable, um, that's when you're more concerned about osteonecrosis because they could have just torn those blood vessels. Um, other things, chondrolysis. So this can be, uh, this is damage to the um, cartilage. It can either be both, either be due to the surgery to fix it or to the, um, the condition itself. Um, then they're, they're also at an increased risk of osteoarthritis um, and femoral acetabular impingement. Okay, next question. Yep, yeah, good. So I'm getting kicked through. Um, so this is Perthes disease. Um, and the reason this is, is because the age group, it's in the right age group, but the main thing in here, the main buzzword is the um, flattened femoral head. And that kind of gives Perthes away. So Perthes is idiovascular, um, idiopathic avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Um, so for some reason, there's an interruption of the blood supply to the head, um, the femoral head, um, and it leads to this necrosis. Um, not sure why, um, in a lot of cases, you don't know why the cause of it is, um, but you can also get some cases in children who are on prolonged steroids. Um, so this is just avascular necrosis of the head because of the steroids, but it's not Perthes disease. Um, so Perthes disease, we don't know why it causes it, but if you've got a kid who's on steroids, then it's just avascular necrosis of the head and you don't call it Perthes. Um, there, there's also other causes of um, just avascular necrosis of the head, but it's um, more common in older people and less common in children. You're more concerned in children if they've been on a long course of steroids. Um, so these kids often are very well and they walk in just with hip pain that's being exacerbated by walking or running. Um, they also do have a um, reduced range of motion of their hip joint as well. Kind of the um, thing that's pathognomonic of Perthes is this flattened um, femoral head on x-ray. Um, so as you can see here, this one's quite smooth and round. But then this one here, you go up and it just flattens off. And that's, that's how you're going to diagnose Perthes. So with Perthes, most of the time, it just gets better itself. Um, it does take quite a few years and you just need to provide them with analgesics and um, the kid will and kind of limit their high intensity exercise and the hip joint will just revascularize. Some kids, however, um, may need to have casting or bracing or surgery if it's particularly bad. Um, and they will have, all of them will have regular reviews by an orthopedic surgeon anyway, and they will decide if that's necessary. Okay, so moving on to inflammatory arthralgias. Um, so another question, I just deleted my chat. Yep, good. Um, so we've got a couple of different answers here. Uh, so this, I'm, I'm getting either transient synovitis or septic arthritis. Um, so this, the answer to this is septic, uh, not septic arthritis, is transient synovitis. And the reason being is that this kid has like a mild hip pain um, and it's been like, yeah, it's just a mild pain. With septic arthritis, kids are going to be in excruciating pain and won't be able to walk. This kid's walking, he just has a limp um, and the kind of buzzword for this is a viral upper respiratory tract infection recently. So that's kind of um, your 
So transient, I'll actually go to my next slide. So transient synovitis is um, inflammation of the synovial joint, and most commonly it's um, in kids who have recently had a viral infection. Um, it's also known as just an irritable hip, um, and usually these kids are quite well. They walk in just saying they've got hip pain, and then on um, history you'll find out that they've just had an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, you, this won't be found on x-rays or anything. You just diagnose it clinically, but you do need to make sure you're excluding other things like septic arthritis. So you're asking, you're, you should be asking about all those septic signs as well. These kids will mostly be afebrile. Um, septic arthritis kids will often be septic, so they'll have a fever. Um, so that's kind of how you differentiate between the two. Transient synovitis will just get better on its own. All you need to do is just um, give them analgesics to help with the pain and then let them know that in a few days it'll, it'll go away by itself. However, you do need to safety net and tell them to go and get a review by their GP. Um, tell them to get a review within probably five days um, as it should have gone by then. But if it hasn't or if it gets worse, then um, the GP can monitor that and um, refer them on to ED if needed um, or if they're concerned about other things. Um, excellent, another question. Um, I can see a question here in the chat. So what is the white blood cell threshold for septic arthritis on joint aspirate? So if you have um, a white cell count over 50, that's going to kind of help you differentiate between transient synovitis and septic arthritis. Um, and same with um, osteomyelitis as well. So septic arthritis will have heaps and heaps of white cells whereas osteomyelitis in the joint, whereas osteomyelitis and transient synovitis won't have so many. So that's kind of your threshold. Good. Okay, good. Excellent. So um, getting lots of questions, so uh, answers. So this is um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, so the things you're looking at here is it's persistent joint swelling in a, in a person that's under um, 16 years and she's had, she has multiple joints involved as well as a rash, um, which I'll go through in a second. So JIA is a persistent arthritis of unknown etiology and it often begins in children who are younger than 16, but they also have to have it for over six weeks. And that's kind of the criteria for JIA. Um, now there are heaps of different arthritis Rittities within JIA, um, but they all have an arthritis, which is um, presence of a joint effusion with decreased range of motion and pain on movement. Um, so the presentation, because there are so many different um, arthritis in JIA, is extremely variable. Um, however, common presentate common symptoms include morning stiffness, so they'll get up in pain, um, and then gelling after inactivity. So this is kind of like where the joint feels kind of boggy after they've been sitting down for a while. Um, and then you have polyarticular or systemic onset disease. So this is where you get your more widespread symptoms and it's just not localized to joints. Um, so these kids can get fatigue, anorexia, rashes, weight loss, um, and kind of in, in, in need to have um, additional treatment um, as opposed to the kids who would just have, for example, um, arthrit an arthritis in one joint. Extra, um, uh, uh, um, sorry. Um, so extra articular manifestations, um, you need to be concerned about particularly in kids who have polyarthritis. And this is because um, they're at an increased risk of uveitis. So about 20, 15 to 20% of these kids do develop uveitis, which is inflammation of like the iris um, and the ciliary, ciliary bodies. Um, so all kids with polyarthritis need to have regular ophthalmology reviews and um, you treat it with topical steroids, so just like eye drops. Uh, and then also other things that you're concerned about is generalized joint failure, um, growth failure. Um, and this is because of the inflammation within the joints. So when you're managing these kids, really the aim is to just reduce pain, um, avoid, trying to help avoid joint damage, um, but also make sure they're growing and developing at a normal rate. Um, most kids will just require NSAIDs, paracetamol. Some kids might require opioids um, and also non-pharmacological interventions, interventions as well, um, like physiotherapy. 
Uh, kids will also be put on methotrexate and this is to help reduce the inflammation within the joints. Um, but because it takes a while to um, kind of start, I think it takes about six weeks for methotrexate to actually kick in. Kids can be bridged with corticosteroids um, and that just kind of helps suppress the inflammation quickly. But corticosteroids are also often uh, well, are also used in systemic disease because it's systemic and you need to suppress the um, immune system everywhere. Um, and then, yeah, I mentioned before physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Um, so these are the types of arthritis. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but the girl in the question would most likely have had systemic arthritis. And this is because of her rash. So often the kids with systemic arthritis do have like a salmon colored rash and it's blanching. Um, other things, so most common is just oligoarthritis. And this is where it's affecting less than four joints. Um, and um, most kids will have just like one joint affected, whether that's a knee or an elbow. And then polyarthritis, these are the ones where they've got heaps of joints and you're concerned about your extra articular manifestations. And you guys can read over that in your own time. It's just from RACGP. Okay, so the next one is Osgood Schlatter. Can I have a drink of water? Um, so this is essentially inflammation of the um, patella tendon at the tibial tuberosity. Um, it's often in they say male athletes, but it can be in any child who's actually, who's quite active. And that's because of the repetitive actions of running or playing sport, jumping um, squats. Now these kids will notice that it goes away when they're just sitting down doing nothing, but then when they start playing sport again, it'll come back. Um, similarly to transient synovitis, this is a clinical diagnosis. Now you can kind of see some inflammation on x-ray, um, but you wouldn't do an x-ray. Um, you will, when you're examining this child, you'll notice that when you're pushing the tibial tuberosity, that it's sore. Um, and then the rest of the joint won't be. Uh, so for management, you just get them to rest, give them pain meds, um, and get them to go to physio if it's, if it's particularly sore and it doesn't seem to, if the rest and analgesia hasn't seemed to help. Um, one complication with this is that they can be left with a, um, like a benign lump in that area. Um, also, this can be just unilateral or bilateral. Um, yeah. Excellent. Okay, moving on to infective arthralgias. I think I have another question. Yeah, excellent. So this is your septic arthritis. Um, someone's drawing on it, <laughs> but so you have, um, so in septic arthritis, this is a kid who comes in really unwell and septic. They have a excruciating pain in their joint and they do not want you to touch it. They will not walk. They've often been brought in, carried by a parent or even the ambulance has brought them in. That's how unwell they seem. Um, so, as mentioned, it's a bacterial infection of the synovial joint and it's an emergency. You need to refer to ortho immediately. It's most common in children who are younger than four in the hips and knees, and often it's by um, spread by the blood, um, but it can also be due to kind of um, trauma to the um, like external surface of the joint if there was a puncture wound, um, and also osteomyelitis can progress to septic arthritis as well. Um, so I mentioned the presentation, um, but the most common um, pathogen is Staph aureus, um, and that's because of the um, like um, because of the hematogenous spread. Um, so your um, septic child most likely caused by Staph aureus, but also your um, external um, kind of trauma to the joint again most likely to be Staph aureus. Other things, unvaccinated kids, you're worried about Haemophilus influenzae, and then kids with sickle cell, you're worried about salmonella. So with this, you're going to do a septic workup essentially, um, but one of the main things um, that you're going to be doing is a joint aspirate. And you're going to do this before you give antibiotics. And that's so you can tell exactly what bug it is. You can, um, you know, the cell count. Um, so the white, the, all the cells in the joint um, and you send off for a culture. 
you keep this child fasted and you refer them to orthopedics urgently as often they will they will need to do an aspiration um, and they can clean out the joint and do a washout as well um, and then they'll also, you'll also start them on IV antis. So often you'll just start them on flu clocks and that's just because you're concerned about staph aureus and they'll be on um, flu clocks for a few, the IV for a few days and then they'll transition to oral. Um, other things is just elevate and immobilize the limb um, to help reduce swelling and pain. And then moving on from that is osteomyelitis. So, presents similarly, um, but it's not as, um, they're not as unwell. So they often have, um, so this is an infection of the long bones and it's often um, around the metathesis, um, most commonly affecting the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Now it can occur um, acutely or chronically. In acute, uh, in chronic, sorry, um, they often kind of present with similar symptoms, but um, low grade inflammation and low grade fever. Um, and you'll also see kind of like um, new bone growth as well if you look on x-ray. Um, pathogens are exactly the same as septic arthritis. Uh, yeah, so non-weight bearing refus refusal to use the limb, kind of, yeah. Do that. <laughs> Investigation, so you're going to do basically the exact same thing for septic arthritis because you are also concerned about septic arthritis. Um, so if it's near the joint, you would do a joint aspirate. If it's not near the joint, you won't. Oh, I forgot to mention, so in osteomyelitis, they can like pinpoint where the pain is basically. Um, so if they're pinpointing near the joint, you're probably going to do a joint aspirate just because you're concerned about septic arthritis. Similarly to septic arthritis, you just keep them fasted and refer them to ED if you're in a GP clinic or refer them to orthopedics immediately. Um, because again, you're concerned about osteo, um, uh, septic arthritis, but also these kids can also become quite septic and unwell if it's left. Um, I kind of want need more detail here with the therapy, but similar things. So you treat them with, um, IV anti, so IV flu clocks, and that's to cover for staph aureus, um, vancomycin, because, um, if they've been in hospital, you're more concerned about kind of resistant bugs, um, and then newborns and sickle cell kids, you give kefetaxime. Again, you elevate and immobilize the limb. If they're not responding to treatment um, or if it's quite severe, that's when you're going to, um, that's when there'll be kind of surgical therapy. So this one often you don't need to do surgical therapy, you just treat with antibiotics. Um, but if it's not responding, then you do your surgical decompression or drainage. Okay. So this is how you tell kind of the difference between septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Um, so similar pathogens, it's the site, so often um, well, septic arthritis is in the joint, whereas osteomyelitis is at the end of the long bones. Um, presentation for septic arthritis, they're really, really unwell. Osteomyelitis, they might not be. They might have like, they might may have a fever, they may not. Um, septic arthritis, they'll just be in pain continually. Um, and osteomyelitis, like I said, it's localized pain. And then I mentioned the white cells before. So over 50, heaps and heaps of white cells, you're concerned about septic arthritis. Okay, neuromuscular conditions. Um, I'm only gonna go through Duchenne's um, because the others are, are just possibility. Um, so this is an X-linked um, neuromuscular condition and it's in, um, uh, well, it's in males because it's X-linked so, and it's recessive. So it's not gonna be found in females, but it's characterized by a loss of, loss of muscle bulk and strength. So often these kids are diagnosed because they haven't been walking by like the age of two or their parents have noticed abnormal things about their um, their, how they stand up or their posture. Um, and when you investigate these children, because of the breakdown of the muscle, you will get a super high CK. Um, so it'll be in the thousands and then you'll find the um, gene on genetic testing when you do that. Um, so other things that parents may notice as well is toe walking. Um, toe walking is um, something that uh, pediatricians are concerned about and they always investigate toe walking um, because children shouldn't really be toe walking. Other things, pseudohypertrophy of the calf, which um, is a buzzword. Um, it's just things that, that require strength in their limbs. That, that's um, the things you'll notice that's going wrong kind of thing. Um, prognosis. So unfortunately for this, um, for Duchenne, it's, it's an incurable disease and it has a really poor prognosis. So the muscle breakdown 
can be slowed but it can't be stopped um so these kids are often in a wheelchair by their teens um and they they die in their 20s because of the cardio um, myopathy and also respiratory respiratory failure um as essentially everywhere just becomes quite weak um so essentially management is aimed at just maintaining their quality of life and improving their quality of life um and this includes physiotherapy and occupational therapy. These kids are also prone to fractures. Um, and this is because the muscles are quite weak. So there's no, um, like the, uh, the bone, uh, the muscles aren't like pulling on the bones, creating tension. Um, and when that doesn't happen, the bones can weaken. Other things you need to, um, uh, what uh, monitor is like their nutrition. Um, so making sure they're, they're um, taking vitamins and everything to help with their bone strength too. And then you can also give glucocorticoids, which can potentially delay cardiomyopathy. Um, there's a few studies out, um, but it can also improve motor function. But ultimately, um, all these children just end up with palliative care and end of life um, care, which is sad. But this is, um, so this is Gower's sign. So um, if a children, if a child does this, this is um, kind of indicative of Duchenne's. Um, so it's where their like their quads just aren't strong enough to help to lift themselves up. So they use their arms and push up on their legs um, to stand up. Okay, so these are just buzzwords for MSK and also I'm not going to go through them. You guys can read them. Um, but now um, I'm moving on to endo. I'm just going to check my time. Ooh, okay, I have to speed through this. Um, so Cover, so I'll go through hypothyroidism. I'm not really going to go through CAH. I made the slide and then realized it's not in your matrix. Um, I'll go through some growth disorders, obesity, and type 1 diabetes. So first up, congenital hypothyroidism. So this is um, thyroid hormone deficiency that is present at birth, and it's relatively common. Um, and it's also one of the leading causes of leading preventable causes of severe learning disabilities. So we need to get onto it ASAP um, in all babies. Uh, so common causes of um, hypothyroidism include dysgenesis, dysgenesis, so this is just failure of the thyroid gland to develop, or actually, no, it's not. There's failure of the thyroid gland to develop, or it can be an ectopic, so it's just not in the normal position. And often, if it's not in the normal position, it's not working correctly. It can be hypoplased. Um, then there's dyshormonogenesis, so this is to do with the thyroid hormone. So it can either be the baby just will never produce thyroid hormone, or it can be transient. So this is where the mum has um, had too much iodine or she's on carbimazole or something that's um, interrupted the production of thyroid hormone in the baby. Um, and often it'll go away after a couple of weeks. And then there's sensual. So this is where TSH is not being produced and that's a pituitary issue. Um, and then ultimately it leads to a reduction in um, thyroid hormone. Um, so these babies present um, with your typical hypothyroidism symptoms, such as constipation, pale, cold, um, dry skin. They also present with failure to thrive, feeding issues. Um, and then later on, there's the developmental issues as well. Uh, I think the buzzwords are like the large tongue coarse faces, which I've got on there too. Um, so most of these babies are detected on neonatal screening with a raised TSH, and that's how we get onto management quickly. Um, so these babies all are put on lifelong thyroxine, and if they're managed well and it's titrated appropriately, then they will all have a good prognosis. Okay, um, another question, which I might skip. So this is um, CAH, which I'm only going to touch on briefly. So this is just... Um, a heap of conditions where, uh, a spectrum of conditions, sorry, where um, uh, there's an enzyme deficiency and it leads to an overproduction of androgens. So in females, this presents with ambiguous genitalia and they're virilized. In males, often it's picked up a bit later and they have kind of like a salt wasting crisis. All of these kids are in, in, in females. Um, often we don't try and assign them a gender when they're born. I mean, it's up to the parents to decide um, and then boys, often that's hard to pick up after they're born because they look like a male. Um, they just present quite floppy and unwell in a salt wasting crisis. And these kids will require um, lifelong replacement of mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. Moving on. Um, so growth hormone, I've only got these ones here. So growth hormone deficiency is just when um, there's uh, growth hormone isn't produced essentially. And these children, they look... Um, 
they have an immature body habitus, also have mid-face hypoplasia. Um, but all you need to do is just give them growth hormone and often this will just promote short-term growth, but also help with um, long-term linear growth as well. Turner syndrome. So this is um, uh, carrier type 45 XO. And these children are female, present with a short stature, wide space nipples, neck webbing. And then they also have um, all their kind of, um, they have um, hormone deficiency as well. So primary, primary ovarian failure, so they'll require pubertal induction, but they'll also require growth hormone to help with the catch-up growth. And then there's just constitutional um, delay in growth. So this is often your healthy, well child um, who is just short for their age and their parents come in saying that they were also short, but now they're a normal adult height. Um, so you just need to reassure the parents that they, um, that the kid will catch up and they'll be um, of normal height. You can give them androgens, which just helps to stimulate a little bit of growth as well. Okay, obesity. So just checking the time. Um, so obesity, uh, I might just briefly go over. So this is where a child is over their um, ideal body weight. There's the complications associated include uh, the same complications associated with adult obesity, so your type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension. Um, and with management of kids with obesity, you need to get the whole family involved and reduce sedentary behaviours, improve the diet, cut out screen time, cut out soft drink. You can give metformin as well, which can help them lose a bit of weight too. Uh, I'm just going to skip this, sorry. <laughs> Masada, is 12.25 right for my time? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, sorry. But you did also start a little bit later, so it's fine. Okay, I'll go through quickly. Um, so type one diabetes. Um, so this is autoimmune destruction of the islet cells in the pancreas, and often these kids present young, but they can um, present into adolescence as well. Um, so they'll present with polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, lethargy, vomiting, um, and you can also get like hyperventilation, which is your cool small breathing. Um, and that's when you're concerned about diabetic ketoacidosis, which I'll go through in a sec. So when you're diagnosing type 1 diabetes, you have your classic symptoms, so the, the ones I just mentioned, plus a um, random blood glucose level over 11.1 or a fasting blood glucose level over 7, um, and that's kind of... Um, Di like that, that diagnoses type one diabetes. Um, and then you also do um, your antibodies. Um, so you send off your antibodies, it'll take a while to come back, but you can essentially assume that this cat kid has type one diabetes um, by their presentation. They'll often be like a skinny kid as well. Other things you send off for is, you can send off for is genetic testing and C-peptide. So management of these kids, they will all be on insulin, um, but there are different regimes that they can be put on. So in, um, they can either be put on like twice daily injections and this kind of suits kids who are still in school. So they get mixed short and intermediate acting before school and after school. Um, and that's just their regime. It's better to be on a multi-day injection regime though, um, as this allows for better sugar control. So they get a um, long acting, which is, um, it used to be called Lantus, but now it's Optisilin. So they get that um, of an evening and that lasts for 24 hours. And then 15 minutes before each meal, they should be on um, their, um, rapid acting insulin. Now, um, then eventually kids can also go on an insulin pump like this cute little picture here that one of our committee members drew. Um, regular, they, these kids also need to have regular screening for uh, everything that, um, so ophthalmology, podiatry, celiac and thyroid. Okay, diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is often how children present for the first time and also in adolescence when they get to that stage where they don't want to use their um, insulin. So essentially um, they have a high blood glucose level. They also have um, either ketonuria or ketonemia and um, metabolic acidosis. So the presentation, I kind of mentioned it before on the other slide, um, but it can be either caused by pump failure. So often in kids who have a pump, if their pump goes wrong, then they can um, go into DKA First presentation of type 1 diabetic kids, they, they will often present in quite severe DK, and then if they miss an insulin dose as well. And this is how you manage DK, DKA. So I say a spider. There is one that's just out there with spider, but I think it's really important to have um, your ABCD first. So you need to um, stabilize, stabilize the child and make sure their airway is um, stable. And you send off for blood. So this is where you do your VBG and your formal um, electrolytes. 
the first thing you do is you hydrate the kids. So you, you give them heaps of saline and this will help bring down their um, glucose. Um, and once you've done that, you recheck their VBG or once you get the VBG back, you decide if you need to replace potassium or sodium. After you've been um, uh, rehydrating for an hour or two, that's when you start insulin and you start it at an infusion around 0.05 to 0.1 units per kilo per hour. And you want to um, infuse them slowly. You don't want to drop their blood sugars rapidly because you'll throw them into a hypo. So only drop it by five millimoles per, um, per litre per hour. And then once it gets down to like 15, then you start your dextrose infusion. And that just helps the kids stay stable. Um, so they're not hypering or hypoing with both the insulin and the dextrose at once. Throughout all of this, you're going to be checking their electrolytes. Often the electrolytes are done every couple of hours and you'll be doing their vitals and everything at the same time as well. And then once they're well, that's when you review, you find out what the trigger is or if they're, um, if they're a first time, if they're presenting for the first time, you assess their control and or their pump. Um, excellent. Okay, and these are just buzzwords for endo um, that I have put down. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Feel free to email me or message me. Um, but I think we are on to lunchtime now.